thank you, choir, and how appropriate to have a story about God's command of both water and fire in this service. It seems appropriate. Hear now the reading of Daniel chapter 3, verses 8 through 30. Accordingly, at this time, certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, an entire musical ensemble shall fall down and worship the golden statue. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews of whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These pay no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. The Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in, so that these men may be brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, and do not worship the golden statue that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and the entire musical ensemble, fall down and worship the statue that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you will be immediately thrown into a furnace of burning fire. And who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. The Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace heated up seven times more than was customary and ordered some of the strongest guards of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them in the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, trousers, hats, and other garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was so overheated, these raging flames killed the men who were lifting Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men fell down, bound into the furnace of raging fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was so astonished, he rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, Was it not three men we threw bound into the fire? They answered the king, True, O king. He replied, But I see four men bound, unbound, walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw the fire had not had any power over the bodies of these men. The hair of their heads was not singed, the tunics were not harmed, and not even the smell of fire came off of them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that utters blasphemy against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, their houses laid to ruin, for there is no other god who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Of all the prayers that we offer to God, I think one of the most common is don't. Don't let this happen. Don't let it be cancer. Don't let the plane keep shaking. God, don't let them die. Don't. 
You know, sometimes we pray in circles, I think. We beat around the bush. We ask God these poetic statements talking about God's will. But deep down, God knows what we're really praying for in that moment is don't. Don't. God knows what's on our heart. And he knows that at the end of the day, while we pray for salvation and deliverance, sometimes what we really want God to do is to take away the thing that we need salvation from, that we need deliverance from, to make it where that doesn't happen, so that we don't have to be saved, so that we don't have to be delivered. We know that God has the power to do this, to calm the storms in our life. We see Jesus do this. We know that God has the power to put out the fires of struggle that burn around us. But what happens? What happens when God doesn't? What happens when the struggles keep coming? What happens when the fire keeps raging hotter? What then? What happens when the thing that we pray so strongly and deeply not to experience is exactly where we find ourselves? Where's God? Where's God's grace? That's one of the hardest questions that I have ever been asked. And I get asked that question a lot. Where's God? Where's God when we struggle? Where's God when we grieve? Where's God when we mourn? Where's God when we suffer? When we watch the news and see things like the tragedy that we saw this week, where is God? People call this out to me and I'll be honest with you. It is the same question that I have called out to ministers and spiritual advisors in my life again and again. When my dad is sick and dying, where's God? When 9-11 happens a week after I turn 18 and sign up for selective service, where's God? Where's God in these tragic times? You see, there are a lot of questions that I don't have answers to. And I'll be real honest with you about that. I have people ask me questions a lot. And I tell them I don't promise easy answers. And sometimes I don't promise answers at all. There are some of these questions that have no answer on this side of heaven. Like why? Why do we struggle and suffer? I don't have an easy answer to that. But this question of where is God? This question does have an answer. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. That is what the story today is all about. Where is God when the fires keep burning? Our story takes place around the 5th century B.C. This is a time when God's people have been taken over by a dominant fearsome world power. The only global superpower at this time, Babylon. And Babylon has an ingenious and terrible way of taking over a group of people. Instead of just going in and ransacking a country that they overtake, they go in, they win, and then they figure out who's the smartest. Who's the leaders? And who are those people's kids? And they take back to Babylon the people with the most skills, the people who are literate, the people with the most education, the people that one day might grow up to create a rebellion against them. Babylon removes from their home and takes with them to enroll them in a new school. A school where for three years they are taught Babylonian literature and philosophy and language. A place where they are given new names. Babylonian names. It's a brilliant way to conquer a people because what it does is it takes away the folks that would be a future threat and eventually puts them in a position to quell any future threats. Daniel and his three friends are among these people. 
their names initially were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And like I said, the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, a man who thinks he is great, he knows he is great. He knows he is without equal. He removes these boys' identity, gives them new names, Belthazar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You see, not only is he interested in taking you from your land, he's taking that part of who you are, how you identify yourself, and attaching that to himself as well. He shortly discovers that these men are the best after three years of their schooling, and he promotes them to high levels within the government. They're actually ten times better than everybody else. And that matters to Nebuchadnezzar because he's interested in one thing and one thing only. It is all about power. This is his obsession, his own power. He wants to make sure that every aspect of your life turns you toward him. You get to live where you get to live because the king say so. You get to work where you get to work because of King Nebuchadnezzar's say so. You get the name you get because of his say so. The fact that you even get to live at all is attached to the power of this ruler. And he soon sees that he hasn't really taken control of everything. He's taking control of your outward stuff, what you earn, what you do. He's taking control of your name, who you are, but he has not taken control of your heart, of your soul. And so that's what he does here. King Nebuchadnezzar builds this monstrosity. It's six cubits. Uh, Bible information here. A cubit is the distance between this finger and your elbow. So it is six cubits wide and 60 cubits tall. Some massive gold monstrosity. And he says, I'm going to get all these instruments. Instruments that poor people play. Instruments that rich people play. They're all going to play at the same time. And when you hear it, you got to worship my gold statue. I want you to notice something. Does it say one time what God that statue's for? Nope. It's not about religious worship. It is not about him turning these people towards his gods. No, it is about him saying, I get to decide what you worship, when you worship, and how you worship. Every part of who you are needs to be my choice, my decision, because I am that powerful. I looked up all these instruments. Some of them are crazy. One of them is an early version of a bagpipe. And what he does is he gets all of these instruments together to create this symphony. And he says, if you hear it, you got to worship. Well, I want to know how far you can hear that because I'm an odd human being. And these are the questions that I ask when I read scripture. And so I figured out a symphony orchestra creates a sound of about 95 decibels, somewhere around 98. This is going to be larger than that. This is going to be outside and bagpipes are loud. So this is going to be over 100 decibels, which travels a distance of 1.3 miles. There ain't no way to get away from hearing this. And so when the music starts, the Jewish people refuse to bow down and worship. And the people who don't like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the people who weren't ten times as good, see this as their opportunity. They go before the king and they butter the king up. They know how important it is to the king that he sees himself as the lone authority in the universe. And those are the words they use to describe to him. If you want to see how self-centered this man is and how self-aggrandizing and important he thinks he is, just count how many times the word his appears in verses 3 through 30. It's 20 times. His hand, his statue that he built. Count how many times his name is mentioned. Twelve. Even the writer of this scripture knows how important who he is, is to this king. And that's what these men do. They know what buttons to press. They walk in, they say, you, O oh king, these people that you promoted won't worship your gods or the statue that you built. They are turning against you. And he ain't going to have that. He flies into a blind rage and has them come before him. And I think that this is a smart move on his part. He's a selfish man. 
He's an arrogant man, but he's not a stupid man. He knows that these guys are jealous. Otherwise, why are they going to tattletale so well? Why are they going to push these buttons? So he brings Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in to defend themselves. Because he likes these guys. They've done a good job for him. He says, I'm going to strike up the band again, and you guys have the opportunity to get down and worship. And if you do, well and good. That's what he says, well and good. And if you don't, I'm going to throw you in that fire. Trust me, I'm going to put you in that fire. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego look up at him and say, don't worry about getting the band to play again. Because we're not going to fall down. We are not going to worship that thing you build. Just as an aside, and I think this is important, this happens in the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. You know what else happens in the 18th year? The temple in Jerusalem is destroyed. So in one year, a temple dedicated to the God that is real is ripped down and a monument built for a God that doesn't even matter because it's not even about that is raised up. These people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego know exactly what happens when God's people worship a golden statue and they are not playing that game. And they say to him, we're not doing this. And he says to them, what God can rescue you and deliver you from my hands? Look at the arrogance there. What God in the universe exists more powerful than me? The king of kings. And they say, ours, ours can rescue us. And even if he doesn't, we still are not bowing down to your statue. If we have to die, we have to die. Too bad. King Nebuchadnezzar has had it. He gets his strongest soldiers because he's all about a show. He gets his strongest soldiers to bind these men up, to carry them to this furnace. And I spent so much time drawing furnaces this week trying to make sense of this story. Like near as I can tell, this is what the furnace looks like in my brain. It may not look like this, but I'll give you the new Robert version of it. All right. The only way it works within the story for me is you've got this giant thing, contraption, furnace that is lifted up off the ground so you can build a fire under it with huge bellows on the side with other people pushing air into that fire to make it hotter because the king orders this thing to be seven times hotter than it's ever been before. Seven is a special number in the Bible. It's thought of at this time as a perfect number, a complete number. So when you hear seven, just know that this is as hot as this thing will go. He is turning it up to 11 right here. And so it's also got a hole in the top. Otherwise, fire won't burn. The smoke's got to get out. And otherwise, the boys can't fall down, as it says. And it's got to have a door up front because that's what the king is looking through. So that's what this thing looks like. And somehow these giant soldiers bind these men up, carry them up, and the heat is too much from the perfect heat of this fire, the complete heat of this fire. And those men die. Those soldiers just die right then and there. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego just fall right in. The king is watching and he is listening. And he has an idea of what he's going to hear in this moment. But that's not what he hears. The Greek translation of the Bible is called the Septuagint. It's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. This is the Bible that's circulating around the time that Jesus is walking the earth. It has a little extra piece in this that I find fascinating. It says that the king hears singing from inside that furnace. He hears singing, and it says that he jumps up in amazement. And know that that word amazement in your Bibles means terrified. It means being fearful. And he has a good reason to be fearful. He has just goaded a God. He's just said, what God can cause you to be delivered from my hand? And he is now standing face to face with that. He's scared. So he goes up to the door. He hears the singing. He sees these people and he turns to his advisors, probably the same men that accused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he says, didn't we throw in three guys? Why are there four? The king has noticed that one of these things is not like the other. And that fourth man doesn't look like a man. He has trouble describing it. At one point he calls it a son of a god, a demigod. 
Another point, he calls it an angel. Regardless, there's something in there that is stronger than him. And he is not going to let that stand for very long. So he calls those boys out to get away from that guy. He says, come out, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they come out, and the king issues a new decree. He says, anybody who says anything bad about those guys, God, who can deliver in this way, and only their God can do this, I'm going to kill you if you say something bad about them. And I'm going to tear your house down. Somebody could make the claim that the king has been transfigured in this moment, that he sees God, that he recognizes who God really is and the glory of who God is. But I don't think that's what happens. I think the king is a master politician. Look at what he's done here. It started out, his whole desire was to pick who you worship. This has failed, but he found a way to turn what has happened to do exactly what he was doing before, to dictate who you worship. Before it's if you don't worship my statue, you die. Now it's if you don't worship my statue or if you disagree with who these guys worship, you also die. He still wins. It has nothing to do with him getting better or learning something. He has an opportunity to grow and change, to admit a fault, but a powerful leader like this, an arrogant person like this is not going to do that. They're going to twist whatever happens to fit their own agenda and to spin it for their own means. Now, a lot has been made about that fourth man. Who is that guy? Some scholars think that it's the same angel that helped Elisha or Elijah last week. We talked about Elijah laying under the broom tree and uh, God brings him through an angel, a cake and some water. Some think it's the same thing. Other people go, this is Jesus. Let's just, let's just go through all the reasons why. Son of God, check. Willing to go into a place where people are being executed, check. Not being able to die, check and check, it's Jesus. Now, it doesn't say one way or the other, but that's a strong claim for Jesus. I fully admit that. But regardless, this shows something powerful is happening in this moment. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego probably wanted God to stop that fire. I have no question in my mind that they wanted God to stop that fire. As they're being bound and carried toward it. I have no question that they wish that God would just put it out because they know that God can. But God doesn't. That fire gets seven times hotter. It gets worse. And what this story shows us is that our God is willing to stand in the midst of that fire with us even when it's still happening. It's a reminder that when those things that we pray to God and say, don't let this happen, don't let this happen, when those things occur in our life, when God doesn't stop it, that God is still with us as we struggle. And something else happens here. Something super weird and interesting. These men aren't burned but when they come out of the fire, they don't have any burn marks on them and they don't smell like fire. I just want you to picture what happens here. Let's visualize it in your brain. You got all the leaders of this country, governors, satraps, prefects, astrologers, the, the leaders. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out of the furnace, what do they do? They run up to them and they smell them. That is really weird. <laughs> Like, imagine uh, a, uh, a person who has been convicted to die. All the leaders of the whole country go and smell this guy. Like, that's what they're doing. Because it's showing something here that is even more powerful, I think. And it's one thing to say that something is more powerful than God standing in the fire. But the fact that God makes it where when we leave that fire, we don't even look like we've been through it. There's something about that that's powerful, too. That we don't even smell like we've been through it. Every single church I've been to, there's these people. And they exist here, too, and you know who they are. They're these people. That when I come, I notice that other people, when they're struggling and grieving and mourning, that they turn to these people in this church to care for them. 
because they know they will. It's people who are confident in their faith. They exist in every church I've ever served. People who you look at them and they just seem like they are radiating with this confidence in who God is in their life. And me being the eternal pessimist that my wife will agree that I am, I always ask the question, like, have they just never been through anything? Has this confidence come because they are untested? And I always learn that no, these are the people that have been through things that are beyond what I can even comprehend. And that somehow they are able to emerge in such a way that they don't smell like that smoke. They're able to emerge in such a way that their experience while it happened doesn't define who they are, but defines who their God is. So that's my hope for us today. I know that we are going to continue to ask God to fix it, to make the pain stop. And I also know that sometimes it's not going to. I don't understand why. I can't claim to. But I do believe that there's never anything that we can face where God isn't willing to stand there with us in the face of it. And that God has the power to do something way bigger than the power of people on earth. No matter how big a statue they can make. God has the power to make it where all of that pain and suffering, all of that struggle doesn't stick to us as hard as His love. A Man, as much as this is a story about where God is in the face of the fires that rage around us, and they do rage around us, it is also a story that should inspire us to stand and to not make compromises. You and I both know that Christians have made terrible compromises in its history. The Crusades was a bad call. And there are a number of other times that Christians have made compromises out of fear of what will happen if they don't. They have chosen to follow the powers of people instead of the powers of God. The reality is the world has not changed. There are still people that raise themselves up. There are still authorities that, that tempt us out of fear to do what they say and to worship what they point at and to value what they see as important. May we learn what these men demonstrate. That we cannot bend when we know what we are being turned to is wrong. And may we know whether God saves us or not, that God stands with us in the face of it. Amen.